mean, it's this, this monstrosity. I wanted to walk in it because it just dwarfs the building. It's so big. It's just, it's huge. Well, I couldn't believe the size of it. It's, it really is a, a huge antenna. And to look at it, you're like, who thought of this? You know, how did they ever think of something like this? If you look at the way it's built, is that there are three concentric rings, there's a building in the middle, and you have these big towers. It looks like a big cage. Well, what could you conceivably put in a cage that large? Well, elephants. So it looked like a cage, and that was the biggest land animal I could think that you'd put in such a cage. So that's, that's where the elephant cage came from. The first time I saw the elephant cage, um, yeah, it, it's very impressive. It's almost breathtaking. Now with AMOC, it's kind of neat because um, at some of the other ones that I've seen, they were a little further away from the actual operations building. But at AMOC, you're right on top of the elephant cage. So I found that to be really neat where I'm like, oh my God, we're sitting in a classroom on the second floor and it's like right out your window and you're looking, you're like right on top of this thing. I think it's just something that it's hard to describe until you see it, that you can believe the size of it. And then knowing like, okay, I'm interfacing with that to do my mission. It is an amazing piece of architecture here. It's on over 40 acres, and it's over 120 feet tall. The pylons themselves go underground for about 30 feet, because the FLIR 9 is made primarily out of wood and out of copper, which you would never guess, because when you look at it, it looks like it's metal, but it's not. That's what I found to be quite extraordinary, is that you could create something so amazing with wood and copper. When you're in tech school and you're learning to be a Morsop and stuff, you know, one of the things they talk about is the antennas you use and stuff. So they, they talk about, oh, you, you know, if you go to one of the sites with the Flare 9, you know, it's the best antenna in the world. The Flare 9 was our meat and potatoes. It was our sole collection source here in Alaska. So the use of the FLIR 9, it was part of a worldwide network of HF collection systems. It's multiple rings of antennas, really. It's more than just one antenna. So it's designed to collect HF signals and create lines of bearing. It's based on a, a German design from 1930s. The FLIR 9 antenna can actually track its lineage back to CDAA, which is what it is. Uh, the CDAA was developed during World War II by a team of German scientists led by Dr. Hans Rindfleisch. The doctor led this team to uh, develop this effort for direction finding for the Nazis in the war. These systems were actually uh, also known under a project name Vullenweber. Vullenweber was actually the perfect cover name because it has absolutely nothing to do with the antenna itself. Germans would deploy this system once they developed it. Uh, operationally, their first deployment would be in occupied Denmark. As the U.S. and the Allies uh, proceeded through Europe and began to take back occupied Europe, uh, the Nazis would destroy these systems. In Denmark, they obviously did not destroy completely one of the systems. And ultimately, when the British sent a lieutenant over after the war to uh, scour Europe looking for parts on these systems, because they have an interest in what was this system about, what did it do, uh, they wanted to exploit that and replicate it, this, uh, this lieutenant goes to Denmark, and in Denmark, he happens to find a goniometer. Goniometer being the heart, literally and figuratively, of the CDAA system. So the British share the goniometer with the U.S., and come 1956, we're at the building up of the Cold War with the Soviet Union. A lot of concern about nuclear attack, uh, nuclear surprise attack uh, from bombers, from submarines. So the U.S. decides they're going to take the goniometer and do their own uh, work, our own work with it, and try to develop our own system. The Naval Research Lab is given the goniometer and given the task of developing an operational system that can be put worldwide. So when they built the original Flare 9 family, they deployed those in the early 60s. At the time they built these, HF was the primary means of military communications. In other words, you had, didn't have satellites much, didn't have cell phones. So that was the main mode of communication. So when they built the antennas, you want to be able to hear the signals from, from very distant locations, but you want to accurately DF, do direction finding. And, and the bigger the antenna gets, 
the more accurate you can get uh, a fix on the target and determine where it's transmitting from. HF is very unique as far as the way it propagates. So the, the targets are sending their signals up into the ionosphere and they're refracting back. So we would use the Flare 9 to try to capture those signals going up or coming back down. And we've had success in some of the collection that we did all over the world literally hearing targets from thousands and thousands of miles away. We could hear stuff all the way to South America, Africa, Europe, uh, Asia, all over the place. The Flare 9 up at AMOC was primarily, of course, used during the Cold War to try to track a lot of those targets. Back in, you know, in the Cold War, you wanted to show your presence, you know, and show Russia that face. So the, the Russians know that the antenna's here. And the Russians actually have a couple, what they call CDAA, which is a circular disposed antenna array, right? So it's basically the same as the Flare 9. So they know what it does. They know the capabilities of it. So the fact that they knew it was here and what the capabilities of, of the antenna are, you know, made that presence known to them that we're listening to you. We were tracking the Russian radar stations they would send in Morse code, and they actually still do this. They're called Russian air defense nets. So these radars would uh, track aircraft as they came into their area of responsibility. And then they would pass Morse code, and we would use that Flare 9 in a receiver to be able to capture that data as that HF energy was being sent up into the ionosphere. We would collect the Russian air defense, and it, it would be Morse, and it would be going sometimes up to two, three characters a second. So you really had to concentrate hard. It almost became, well, it was a second language. You never forget it, so I still know Morse code to this day. They came in the military in 1986, and they told me, what are you going into Morse for? They're going away with that, and it's still alive and kicking, so. <laughs> Who uses Morse code? That's like, a hundred years ago, no one uses that anymore, but I quickly found out it's going to be around for a long time. That's like any technology today. Like, for instance, kids that aren't taught penmanship. Okay, well, what do their signatures look like? It's sort of like the same thing. We've got to maintain that historical perspective because if we don't and they resort back to it, we're going to be lost. That's why we still have Morse operators that sit in this building. The criticality of the HF Morse code mission and you know, how we're transitioning that to our civilian workforce. You know, we have a number of military personnel and that's been a military skill for, for years. Since we are the only U.S. location still doing Morse code, the military has decided that you know, it's not worth maintaining that skill. So we've been in the process of civilianizing that with Air Force civilians and we've kind of allocated a number of billets to transition that. The challenge is, is Morse code. We will end up being the sole trainers and proprietors of HF Morse code. Again, the criticality of that aspect of it is, is they still use it, so we still have to maintain a capability and become self-sufficient in both the training and operational use of it. The only type of collection we really had was from airborne reconnaissance aircraft like EP-3s and RC-135s, the U-2 as well as the SR-71. So that was our first objective, was tactical reporting on those aircraft. They would go in and see how far they could get in or close to Russia and what type of reaction or the USSR would have to our aircraft being in these certain areas as we were trying to monitor their activities. Well, when they would scramble MiGs or other types of, of fighters, these radar stations would track that and within the air defense there would be codes that we were able to break to know what those radar stations were saying and if those MiG fighters got close enough to our aircraft we would report back to our aircraft and say hey you got MiGs within 30 nautical miles of you and they're off to the north so we would sit and track these things for hours and hours and days and days so you would kind of go home and you'd just be mentally exhausted from copying Morse code from for almost eight straight hours some days. It was literally when it was busy and there was exercises going on where you had to kind of unplug your headsets and somebody else plugged in their headsets so you could go to the bathroom and then come back and start copying again. I remember sitting down that night and the target started going. The next thing I know, somebody's tapping me on the shoulder. It's like, hey, it's time to go home. And you didn't want to go home. Here you are like a 20-some-year-old person never being out of the United States before, and you're sitting out here tracking these MiGs. It was very, very exhilarating and, and exciting.
So I think that Flare 9 really was our baseline to really gave us an opportunity to learn about our targets and, and understand our targets, which led to engineers being able to build us this technology and maybe even taking some of the lessons that we learned from, from years ago off of the Flare 9 and incorporate that into new technology or be able to make antennas that are smaller. The one here at Elmendorf, the reason it's probably the last one in existence is the maintenance on it was better than just about any other site. So our Flare 9 people here did a fantastic job of upkeeping it. It's also easier because it's on U.S. soil, so that made a big difference too. We've seen kind of all this unfold over the last 15 or 20 years, and now we're at a point where the operators that work for me now sit on what looks like almost like a PC, and then the computer kind of does the rest of it. Definitely sad to see the Flare 9 go away, but it was sad to see some of these other things go away too, because I think it gave the worker or the operator a more sense of what they were doing, and it was more work, I guess you could say, like you were doing this work instead of the computer doing this work. So I've been trying to really, and my team, try to really get out of um, that there's much you know, for the operators that it's not a green and red light scenario. That is part of it, but what does it mean when that green light is on? What's going on when that green light is processing data? You know, so just trying to teach them what is going on behind the scenes. I guess I'd just like people to understand it always hasn't been like this. Thousands of people have put their heart and soul into getting where we are today. And we've learned so much from this Flare 9 antenna. So I'd like to keep mentioning it to people as long as I'm around, that even though we may not use it today, it has extreme benefits. We wouldn't be doing what we are today without having been given the opportunity to use the Flare 9. Here at the AMOC, even without the Flare 9, without the elephant cage, we're gonna continue doing our absolute best when it comes to strategic aviation. We'll continue to excel, we'll continue to look for new technology, will continue to find other ways to collect the data we need to ensure that we always protect the homeland.